Thanks for tuning in to DNBNN. Today's segment is going to be on performance enhancing drugs. Hi, I'm Brittany. We're going to do a little history lesson on performance enhancing drugs today. Starting off with ancient times, in the early Greek, the Olympians used various herbs and mushrooms that might have some pharmacological actions as stimulants. Aztec athletes used cactus-based stimulant resembling strychnine. Athletic competitions probably developed in tribal societies as a means of training and preparing for war and hunting. There are various psychoactive plants that were used by tribal peoples during battles and hunts. Next, we're going to talk about the early use of stimulants. During the 1800s and the early 1900s, there are three types of stimulants that were reported to be in use by athletes. The first being strychnine, the second, cocaine, and the third, caffeine. Starting off with strychnine, it became a famous rat poison. At low doses, it can act as a central nervous stimulant. If the dose is too high, a seizure or seizure activity will be produced in the brain, resulting convulsions can paralyze respiration and leading to death. Some boxers were reported to have used strychnine tablets that might have made them more aggressive and kept them from tying quickly, but dangerous to do so as well. The availability of amphetamines later made drugs such as strychnine less attractive. Some evidence indicates occasional use continued at the level of world's competition into the 1960s. Cocaine was also available in the 1800s, at first in the form of Mariana's Coca Wine, which was referred to in some advertisements as wine for athletes. When pure cocaine became available to athletes, it quickly adopted this more potent form. Many athletes used as many athletes used coffee as a mild stimulant, and some added pure caffeine to their coffee or took caffeine tablets. Next, amphetamines. They were widely used throughout the world during World War II and in the 1940s and 1950s. Reports of use of these pet pills by professional soccer players in England and Italy. Boxers and cyclists also relied on these. More potent than caffeine, longer lasting than cocaine, and safer than strychnine. It seemed to be an ideal ergogenic energy producing drug for both training and competition. In 1952, the presence of syringes and broken anvils in the speed skating locker room at Oslo Winter Olympics was an indication of amphetamines' presence in international competition. Reports also came from the 1952 Summer Games and the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. Moving on to steroids. During and after the World War II, it was found that people could gain weight and build themselves up more rapidly if they were given the male hormone testosterone. Soviets were first put to, put to hormone use to build their athletes. An American team physician at the 1956 Olympics reported the Soviet athletes were using straight testosterone. Testosterone helps both men and women become more muscular, but, it also, but it's the masculinizing effects on women and enlargement on the prostate gland in men that are definite drawbacks. The American physician returned to the U.S and help develop and test antibiotic steroids, which were adopted quickly by American weightlifters and bodybuilders. These drugs were not banned or tested until the early 1970s, mainly because a sensitive urine test was not available until then. Moving on to the bowel scandal. For years, there were rumors that professional baseball players were using steroids, but MLB did not test for them. When Barry Bonds came into the 2001 season looking for bigger and stronger looking bigger and stronger, and went on to hit a record of 79 home runs. Some thought steroids were involved, but rumors were denied. In 2002, player Ken Kamiti admitted to using and said half of the Major League Baseball is using too. In June 2003, an unidentified track coach delivered to the U.S. anti-doping agency a syringe containing an undetectable steroid naming the source as Victor Comte, founder of Balco Laboratories. An analysis determined the syringe contained THG, a steroid previously unknown to the agency. Balco, the Balco investigation led to a raid of the laboratory and the discovery of other steroids and human growth hormones. Comte testified before the jury after being given immunity from prosecution and named a long list of Olympian and professional athletes who had been his clients. In 2006, the season of MLB 
instituted more testing and toughened penalties for drug policy violations. In addition, testing for amphetamines was also included for the first time. That concludes the history of performance enhancing drugs, and now on to Jenna. Hi, my name is Jenna, and today I'm going to be talking to you about steroids. But first, we need to learn a little bit about the male sex hormone, testosterone. The effects of testosterone are divided into two categories. The first, androgenic, and the second, anabolic. Androgenic effects are known as the masculinizing effects and include such things as initial growth of the penis and other male sex glands, deepening of the voice, and increased facial and body hair. Androgenic steroids mimic the androgenic effects of testosterone. Moving on to anabolic steroids, which are the uh, most commonly known type of steroid, they mimic the effects of, you guessed it, anabolic testosterone. These effects include increased muscle mass, increased size of various organs, such as the heart and lungs, control of distribution of body fat, increased protein synthesis, and increased calcium in the bones. So basically, they make you super strong. Beginning in the 1950s, drug companies began synthesizing steroids with more anabolic and less androgenic effects. Anabolic steroids have become well known for their use by athletes, as Brittany talked about earlier. Although studies indicate that with proper diet and training, the effects of anabolic steroids are minimal, there may never be accurate data to know what the effects are at the high doses that athletes are taking due to the unethical amount of steroids a subject would have to take. For example, some athletes practice stacking where they take more than one steroid at a time. This is done by both injecting and taking an oral form of steroids simultaneously. And now moving on to the psychological effects of taking anabolic steroids. Uh, the road to becoming unnaturally buff and having unnatural athletic capabilities is not an easy one. And along with all these new muscles and a slew, <laughs> comes a new slew of psychological effects, which include a stimulant-like high, increased aggressiveness, and a dependence that develops in some users. Taking steroids can also cause a manic or depressive state, and there is also a symptom known as roid rage, which is a manic rage that has been reported in some users. Warning label. Let's talk about the adverse effects of taking steroids. They can stunt your growth if you take them in adolescence. All users are at risk for paleosis hepatitis, or in English, bloody cysts in the liver, which can lead to atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, and heart disease. And on a final note, after the Omnibus Crime Control Act of 1990, Anabolic steroids became listed as a Schedule 3 drug. And now to our on-scene reporter, Peter. Thank you, Jenna. My name is Peter, and I'm reporting from Vernon Hills, Illinois. There's a lot of controversy over steroids and if, they're act if they actually work, so let's take a look at their benefits. It has been proven that stimulants have been shown to improve endurance. Just like any other drug, there's always a chance for a potential benefit when using steroids. Recently, there was a study done that showed that it, take it took an athlete two years to get a 1% improvement in their uh, mile speed time. In another recent study, amphetamines have been shown to have improvements in events that require brief power as well as endurance, with events like the shot put and or the mile run. Along with that, it's been proven that amphetamines can mask fatigue effects when training. There have been a few studies that try and show that steroids or amphetamines have no effect and that they're ineffective when used with training and or performance, and that, as we all know, is false and inaccurate always be a positive benefit associated with the use of an amphetamine like a steroid um, but what we want to do is try and inform you of healthy alternatives that you can use when training and or playing in games so when we talk about healthy alternatives to steroid use there's a lot that a person can do in order to help elevate their training and performance in games a lot of that comes back to your overall health uh, how much you sleep at night what food you're putting in your body um, if you're training pro properly when you do train, a lot of that will help um, improve your training as well as your on-ice or in-game performance without the use of steroids. Another healthy alternative which has been proven uh, successful is the use of a supplement called creatine. Um, creatine, along with many other supplements, uh, maybe a pre-workout, will definitely help you um, 
more effective in your training versus the use of steroids, which can be so dangerous to your body while still mimicking similar results. And especially if you go back to your health and train better, eat better, sleep better, you're going to be more rested and want to um, train harder so you can participate in your games at a higher level. Thank you for listening. Now back to Jenna and Brittany. Thanks, Peter. And thank you, audience, for tuning in to our segment on performance-enhancing drugs. Stay classy, Fairbanks.